Uh, yeah, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's session. I hope everyone's having a great day and really appreciate you taking some time to join us. My name is Taylor Stuck. I'm a business development executive here at Burwood Group, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. So today's topic is Ask the Experts, an interactive, sassy panel, and Burwood Group is thrilled to partner today with Cisco in the session. Uh, before we get into it, there's a few housekeeping items I'd like to cover. Uh, we've allocated one hour for today's session, and we are recording. So a recorded version will be sent to everyone after the webinar. If you have any questions throughout, please use the chat or Q&A window on the right-hand side of your WebEx browser, and we'll get to them as many as we can. As a thank you for attending today's session, uh, we are giving away a beautiful Uni Coda 12 outdoor pizza oven and a pizza kit from Anjali. Uh, in order to win, you must submit a question in the chat window or Q&A during this webinar, and at the end, we will randomly select the winner. Uh, you must be present to win. So jumping over to our panelists real quick, we'll meet our presenters. Scott? Thank you, Taylor. Hello, everyone. My name is Scott Nichols. I'm the modern, uh, practice director uh, for professional services at Burwood Group. Uh, I've been in the industry for 28 years, various roles from architecture to engineering to management. It's a pleasure to join you today. Hi, my name is Sajad Khan. Um, I'm a technical architect with Burwood. Um, doing security practice for 27 years now, uh, from professional services to many services, and uh, having managing teams as well. Hey everybody, I'm Dave Abbott from Cisco Systems, and uh, I'm a technical solutions architect there. So I've been in this role now for around six years, been building both networking and security practices for our customers all, all around the country, and looking forward to talking sassy today. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, so what are we gonna cover today? We're gonna go through kind of business challenges that you can expect in various industries and verticals, uh, kind of go through the definition of what exactly is SASE and how does it apply to you. Uh, and then we'll go into the panelists. We'll ask the experts and have a little audience Q&A. So we'll jump into the content. Thank you, Taylor. But first we wanna really uh, kind of dive into what we're seeing in the industry, what, what all of us are seeing. Um, from, from users being dispersed due to COVID over the last two years, uh, more and more branch um, identification coming to the to the to the to, uh, to the front. Uh, how do we connect our branches and 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 the distributed nature of, of applications in today's world? All these things are, are are affecting how we design and architect infrastructure today. And and we, hopefully we can get you through to a point where you're more comfortable understanding the strategies that we have at Burwood Group. Um, to enable you to, to maximize the user experience uh, and reduce the latency, trim your cost, and provide a much more seamless integrated network infrastructure. Uh, and, and on top of that, we're going to add security into it because this is a SASE conversation. So SASE, we're going to dive into a little bit um, more about what that truly means. But really, the applications, the way we connect, and how the users have been dispersed are the current business challenges that we, we really want to dive into today. So back on the market analysis. So the, the Gartner Group market analysis for, for SASE, I mean, it's it's really been a buzzword out there for oh, a good four or five years, I would say. And it, every year, year over year, the 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 compounded annual growth rate is just accelerating um, to a point where now we're we're anticipating a growth rate of 36 on on, on a compounded annual growth rate, 36 percent growth, 15 billion dollars by 2025. What does that mean? It means that there's an adoption that's going on like crazy, right, in the marketplaces, that they're, they're, this is real, um, you can feel it and touch it, and you can implement it. So a lot of organizations are, are really digging into how they, they, they get on this journey, and we're going to help you start that, that journey today through this, this webinar. Um, you know, 60% of the inter enterprises today have already developed a SASE strategy, and that's one of the things that we do here at Burwood, is we really dive into helping you understand how you can achieve that strategy. Um, and not everyone's going to be on the same pace. Um, some folks are, are going to be, you know, really a stepping stone one step at a time, and some may take two or three at a time. It's all uniquely developed and designed for you and your organization. The key here that you need to understand with, with, with SASE is that the security must be embedded within your network infrastructure, within your access points, because as we've de developed all these distributed applications, users working from home, multiple work sites, We've distributed the applications. We, we have a much larger attack surface than we had just four years ago. And that's really where SASE helps you define and really close down some of those policies 
And then as we get into growing into larger organizations where you're, you're really speaking of, you know, thousands and thousands of users, what we all struggle with um, in the past is how do I manage all of this, right? So the, what SASE delivers you is a unified management platform to orchestrate your security across your entire enterprise. Perimeter-based approaches to securing anywhere, anytime access creates that added complexity that we talked about. So one of the things that SASE as a whole and all the framework and all the tools that are coming in, there's a lot of them are cloud delivered. What does that mean? That's a buzzword. We get that part of it, right? But what does it really mean to the business side of your organization? That means that we're, we're going to be driving the cost down, reducing complexity and, and reducing the ability, or I'm sorry, increasing the ability to, for you to pivot and be agile in your in your environment. So the last thing that we'll talk about is that you need to really understand that SASE is pragmatic. And it's a compelling model that you need to start at some point. You don't have to, if you're late to the game, that's okay. You can start today and you can begin your journey. And we're here to help you do that. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dave. We're gonna get into a little more deeper discussion about defining what SAS is. We can't have that discussion with you in depth if we really don't give you that framework. So my good friend Dave is going to help us with that. Thanks, Scott. So just as Scott said, it really does come down to SASE being a framework rather than a specific product. In fact, SASE is this convergence of networking capabilities and security, ultimately creating a fabric. And we've got, you know, acronym soup these days with the capabilities that SASE looks to deliver. But in a nutshell, SASE itself was defined by Gartner back in 2019. Uh, so beforehand, we had plenty of organizations leveraging a lot of these different technologies, but in a disaggregated model. They were leveraging uh, traditional WAN topologies of hub and spoke and doing that either over private circuits an MPLS or trying to build their own tunnels, say, with the MVPN over a public link. And then on the flip side, we had folks that were building out their own security practices, maybe with somewhat of a cloud-based nature, but primarily in a defined data center. And as we've evolved these technologies, we've recognized that we now need to move into something that's got a proper software-defined control in the networking aspect. And as well, making sure that we are more cloud native with our security controls and leveraging that cloud security um, outside of a hub within our own data center. And a lot of this is because we've seen a massive shift in where our applications live. When more and more of our applications live in the cloud, it makes sense for us to be able to get directly to them. And therefore, we need technology and infrastructure to support that type of motion. But of course, we can't move away from the traditional security controls we've had for compliance and regulatory needs, we have to be able to carry a lot of that capability into this cloud fabric. And so on the left side, we see the importance of networking and bandwidth optimizations and content delivery networks that are optimizing our user experience while inherently giving us security in mind not just network security, but the cloud access security brokerage and our cloud secure web gateways, zero trust network access and VPN use in a hybrid model, as well as our uh, firewall as a service from our browser isolation and DNF protections, right? All of these are security controls that are absolutely important. And now we're moving into this more cloud native model. So to do that, when we look at the framework, we really bake it into three different components. And the first becomes that networking side, right? App optimization, leveraging route-based intelligence and app-aware uh, infrastructure, rather than using something that would be a traditionally just CLI-based approach. And we can do this with you know, a firewall, of course, or a traditional router, but it makes a lot more sense when we have intelligence powering the decisions in an automated fashion. The second is the security piece in mind, and this is mainly leveraged in a cloud-based proxy where we can now use the economies of scale in a cloud service across a global dispersed environment. Rather than it being a handful of data centers that you own and manage, you now can get access to dozens, if not hundreds, of cloud-based locations for these services. 
Then finally, of course, the identity is a critical component of zero trust mantra. The idea that you get the least privileged access to your environment, right? Get to the resources you need to, and you have access to nothing else you don't need. And all of these com combine into this unified visibility policy and integration model. And Cisco is one of the few vendors out there that can actually deliver each and every one of these components. Now, what's important when we try to bring this together is two fold, is two main topics down below. The first is it has to be a simplified deployment. We're trying to improve our user experience, and that's not just for our end users, that's also for our IT staff that is organizing, building, designing, and maintaining this infrastructure. It has to be easy to integrate and bring together as well as provide day to operations. And the other thing we recognize is that many organizations have a lot of different constraints or requirements. You know, a healthcare organization looks vastly different from a government or manufacturing institution. And we have to be able to deliver versatile options. So you see acronym soup out here and you might start asking, well, shoot, do I need a unified single sign on and ZTNA and VPN and device health and trusted endpoints and all of that? And the answer could be, it depends. It depends on your specific organizational need, but know that all of these options fit within this SASE framework. It could be that you are very cloud heavy in your applications, or it could be that you're primarily running everything on prem still. SASE can apply to both of those environments. In fact, it applies to just about any environment because of how operationally diverse it can be. So we wanna keep that in mind that there are options. And part of what we're going to go through today in our Q&A is recognizing which options make the most sense for your organization and what are some of the key things you should be looking for as you're evaluating your SASE journey. Awesome. Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, so now let's transition to some questions. Uh, please submit any questions you may have in the chat box and as they come in, we'll address them. I'll give it a minute or two just to have them come in first. <laughs> Yeah, Taylor, more waiting on those questions to come in. Just wanted to, uh, to kind of add some more color to what Dave is saying that, uh, that I think is it's really critical for for those uh, that are joining us today that, that haven't started their journey. And, and that is that, you know, there, there's no one perfect uh, shoe doesn't fit everyone's feet. Right. Um, it's all different. And, and that's really why it's a customizable approach, why you really need to in, in, invest the time to work with uh, folks that understand that to meet your needs um, where you need to be met um, is the best way to put that, right? Um, and that is that not everybody is gonna get through, the, uh, Dave mentioned the acronym SOUP, right? That uh, we talked in there. Not everyone's gonna go through that full stack of journey, right? There's just some some parts of that that are, are not gonna be applicable to your environment or that, that you may have other solutions in play. But the important thing here is that you understand that there's a framework and that there's a journey that you need to start on and that you get started with the foundation and you can add and layer on all those other components as you grow and mature within your, your, your SASE journey, you can add those to, to, um, to the platform as you move on. And that it's, it's nothing that's a throwaway, but it's a build on, right? So it's like a Lego, Lego concept where you're adding those, those layers and you get more and more to the, the full maturity model that Gartner speaks to uh, within their uh, framework. Awesome, thanks, Scott. Uh, so we have our first question from Michael. How can SASE help secure my network from outside threats? No. Well, that's a good question. Well, I think, Dave, we could probably, we can all three address that. We will get three to, three to the same opinions at one time. I'll take the first shout out, shout out right? So how, let's repeat it again, make sure everybody heard it check real quick and we'll just dive into it. Yeah, definitely. So how can SASE help secure my network from outside threats? Well, SASE doesn't secure anything. That's the first thing, right? Because that's, that's the first part of that, that, that question that's wrong. SASE is a framework. It doesn't really secure anything. But to be really uh, uh, specific with you, SASE has several components within it that help secure your network from the outside, right? That's that posture, uh, elevation of posture that you're going to get across all of your different endpoints. Um, so to exact a particular product, which again, SASE is a framework, let's talk products. Products and how it can secure from the outside is for your remote access. We'll start with the foundation, right? If you have a remote location or a remote user, and both can be used for a an office or a home, and that is an SD WAN device, right? So we'll start by an SD WAN device. 
that can that has is locked is hardened so that it does not take any connections other than the ones that it's established with his tunnel partner. So no other connections can come in. That's a base level foundation of security that you get without writing any policy, right? That's just a foundational piece of that. So then we can get into the more advanced feature sets of tooling, and we'll let Dave talk to a few more of the, about those. So a, a few things when I think about outside threats um, is I want to be able to protect my crown tools, which inherently are going to be living within my applications, and underneath that is the data, right? What's important to me, and then it could be PCI, it could be HIPAA-related, it could be that I've got intellectual property that I'm protecting. It could be I want to make sure that my environment is having uptime and that we don't get hit by ransomware and it cripples our environment. So ultimately, I have to be able to protect my applications. And one of the challenges that we see now is there's rapid cloud adoption is we start losing some of the control we had initially, right? A lot of it before was this castle and moat protection, and I put big beefy firewall in front of all my apps, and then I have this inbound outbound type protection. But now as my apps move into environments I don't control as well, I need to leverage other types of security controls. And some of those might live in a cloud access security broker. Others are in a uh, ZTNA type model, zero trust network access, where I'm reverse proxying my connectivity into a specific application rather than an entire environment. All of these are ways that give me more granular controls to newer environments that I might not have the same types of protections I thought I had or I'm used to having. SASE helps address a lot of those new use cases. And in fact, it helps you compound those protections by unifying the policy. A big thing by having this type of framework and with the capabilities that um, Scott's bringing up, like a web proxy, like CASB, like Zero Trust Network Access, is it gives me a unified policy so that no matter where my worker is and no matter where my application lives, I can set that policy so that uh, only the people that need to be able to access it can access it. And I set up identity policies that way. I have DDoS protections across my applications, inbound protections for inspection, and outbound protections so that they don't go to outside threats. And outside threats can look of various different ways, right? You can have proactive attacks that are coming in to attack your application, or you can have the honeypots, the reactive ones, the ones that live out in the internet and, and your end users are accidentally going to or being redirected to. We need protections on both of those fronts. And the great thing is SASE and the capabilities underlying that framework address all those use cases, whether it's in cloud environments or on-prem. Yeah, let, let me bring that in real quick for you, Dave, a little bit more on that. And that's what we were talking about before we got into this slide. That, that's really key about everyone's journey is different, is that as we start building these framework pieces in with the SASE model, um, you, you're speaking of cloud-delivered firewall services or access services. The initial implementation of that can be very simple with everyone's treated the same way, right? I just look at it, if I'm allowing your connection, if I have a cert on my machine, however I choose to allow someone in, the door's open for everyone that I, that's on my list. The next extension of that is how we, when we talk about how these things evolve, is that there's now another opportunity for you to say, let's use identity and have your identity go around with you to all the parts of my infrastructure and my applications, right? So that's another level that you can use as you've built this foundation now I can start to level uh, to layer in identity into my uh, my security stack, so where it, it could be not only am I a, a member of the company or a member of this organization or a member of this group, but I'm a member of this subgroup, and only this subgroup can have access to these things, right? So that's how you start to layer in the, what the art of the possibility is, is how you grow. You didn't start doing that right away, but you built the foundation. To, that enables you to evolve to that level of tightened security. So that's what we mean by the journey is different for everyone and the path will always be different. So John, do you want to add anything to that? Sure, basically I think uh, uh, what Scott just mentioned, it's a journey, right? So you have to start somewhere and it's not like you have to, you have to um, start acquiring new, new products um, uh, by new hardware and whatnot, basically what you have that can be assessed and you start building on that, right? And 
having that map, it has to be, it has to be, um, you know, from business point of view, having an understanding exactly how you're securing that. So that is critical. And, uh, you know, um, from a um, securing point of view, like, you know, like this is an SDP, like a software defined parameter, right? So what is that parameter going to be? That is what SASE is going to present and, and give you that um, an overview, how you can leverage what you have and probably, you know, add to that and secure your network. And so that awesome. actually leads perfectly into our next question regarding kind of purchasing hardware or services in addition to their already existing infrastructure to implement a SASE architecture. Can you all explain or dig a little deeper into that? Of are there any necessary purchases, whether it be hardware, software, or services, for them to make that initial first step? Um, yes, um, there are. Not that you could not implement a by definition, software means that you have to have a software-enabled device capable, right? Um, so most vendors, um, <coughs> you'll you'll be licensing and buying products from them that will enable you to begin that journey. So what is the first thing that you do? Mo if it's a remote office or branch solution, um, the first thing that you're going to look to do is 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 invest in an SD WAN vendor that has a journey, a, a roadmap for you to extend all these other features that we're, that we're talking about. So it would be that uh, SD-WAN uh, vendor choice would be that foundation and what that looks like. So as you move into looking at those things, I found most organizations are usually after, uh, they're, they're investigating these opportunities uh, from a refresh perspective, an end of life perspective, licensing's becoming an issue, all these things. And then there's also circuit cost, right? So uh, the, what, what SD-WAN brings, brings to the table for you is your ability to commoditize your transport um, of your packets in your network. Um, very easy, very seamlessly. So no longer am I relying upon private line services and huge bills um, and cost per packet that you get out of those services. You're now able to leverage broadband internet type services that provide as good performance. The benefit to those, why I say start with that, is because now you're talking about the, the business op objectives being achieved here, and that is not just replace for the sake of replacing. Replace to be better and cheaper is always the best way I'm gonna go after it, right? So that's really what SD-WAN brings to the table as a, as a good foundation. That's a foundational framework of, of, of SASE that I think that we, we have to start with. And maybe Dave, you have another one, or Sajad, you guys chime in here and, and come up with, if you have a second one. Yeah, I, I think when I, I mean, picture an existing environment. We have routers, right? And maybe firewalls that are at the edge. And their intent is to get me to my applications, which mainly live within a data center in my headquarters. And uh, we're assuming that we're in some form of a cloud migration journey. It could be just a couple of SaaS applications. You're forced in Office 365 and you've gotten off an exchange server, but maybe the rest of your apps are on-prem. What we're still seeing though, is that organizations want to make that shift into more of an SD-WAN type approach for the ability, just as Scott called out, to automate some of those capabilities to reduce the costs that businesses want to be able to reduce, especially around circuits, and to be able to get more efficiency, be able to get direct internet access for some of those cloud applications that you started to turn up. There's two other pillars in here that we can discuss as well if you're starting your journey in a different position. The other thing I think about from a two pillars perspective is either on if I'm using traditional VPN, maybe I want to start moving off of that full tunnel approach and into something that's either split tunnel or giving me zero trust network access or private access, if you will. And there's a number of vendors, Cisco with Duo included, that can provide that as a stepping stone. And that would be a service you would look to procure um, is rather than having a firewall in your data center and spinning up VPN termination, I now use a cloud service, this private access service um, that enables that application access without having to turn on a VPN. The third is outbound web protections. What we've seen is a, as a number of users are moving into the remote world or are living in this hybrid world is um, 
a lot of their traditional protections where either you turn on VPN to go through my on-prem firewall for web inspection, or we just sent you out to the internet hoping and trusting that you're going to environments that are safe, and we just had an endpoint protection, like an AMP for endpoints, a Sophos, a McAfee, you name it, living there. And what we've learned is that's not enough. That's it's not giving us the defense and depth and visibility into the endpoint that we require and ultimately need better security protection. So the ability to leverage a cloud delivered firewall and a web proxy for all my outbound connections for my remote users is a service that is picking up massively as customers move into hybrid work and are living there to stay. So that's another service that we see uh, organizations starting to procure more and more. And that's where we see that that CAGR that, that Scott talked about, that 36% growth compound, a lot of it's being driven in that fashion for protecting the remote workers and giving a better defense in depth as they go to outbound security threats. That's the amazing thing about this, this framework is that we just talked about two very different things, but they're both a part of SASE framework, right? Yeah. That's, that's, that's the great thing about this is that, it, and that's why we said, Everyone's a little different. Every use case is a little different, but there's a solution for every one of those use cases. To your point, you are a SASE, you are using SASE if you have a, a VPN client that you're tunneling, you're tunneling to your cloud-based firewall, that you're split split tunneling to your MSO 365 instance for your company. That is a part of SASE. That is a, a, a part of that journey. That we just left out SD WAN altogether, right? But that's this is for the the end user. You could essentially do that across multiple users in an office and just have a cable modem uh, device sitting there, um, you know, taking the internet and then run SASE off of that. That's that's what we mean by is that it's different for everybody, and there's different use cases that you apply these tools to, but they're all a part of the SASE framework. Um, so, John, you want to comment on this a little bit? Uh, sure. Basically, I think one of the, the big advantage would be is that you know having a single policy framework as well, right? So you have a single policy respective where your user is, uh, how they connect, uh, knowing that user and uh, and having that one single policy that you can control, right? Where they can access, what they can access, endpoint security. You know, uh, Dave talked about that. So that is one big, right? You can you can control knowing that the device from where your user is connecting. Having full control of that, uh, of that, and identifying the user, right? Um, one good example would be from ICE perspective. Also, ICE is, a, is a, can be leveraged for that as well. Where and having policies where the users uh, users get followed, right? So you know which user can access what resources. It's knowing uh, and the device that they are connecting from. So that uh, that you can leverage different um, applications to control that. And uh, um, I think, Dave, I give it back to you from here. All right, next question. Yeah, we'll pivot, yeah, we'll pivot a little bit. So um, we have a question from Eric looking to better understand the leading solutions in the space, given that there are many partners. You want to start with uh, Dave? Yeah, so I'll, I can hop in, and I promise to be unbiased here. Uh, but as being from Cisco, I think I got to jump in on this. So there are inherently a lot of vendors in this space providing capabilities, and some are only focusing on a singular capability or outcome, and then partner with other third-party vendors to provide the complete SASE solution. Cisco, of course, has all the capabilities, but we're not the only ones. And so when we break down SASE, I think there's three ways or three buckets you can look at it. You have pure play SSE or security service edge uh, vendors that only provide that cloud security capabilities and are delivering it in a cloud native fashion. Uh, these are going to be your Zscalers, iBoss, Netscope the ones that have grown in that web proxy and cloud-delivered firewall private access type realm. Uh, Cloudflare and, and Microsoft are certainly living in some of that realm as well. On the complete opposite side is your pure play SD-WAN vendors, the ones that are only focused on the networking and the connectivity and want to provide you that cloud access and then integrate to those SSE vendors. Um, these are going to be your uh, you know, Velocloud, Silver Peak to the world, 
the ones that are focused on a lot of that connectivity aspect. Of course, with Cisco, we have the SD-WAN as well as that security service edge, but there are others. So Fortinet and Palo Alto are the ones that kind of come to mind when you think of the ones that have an SD-WAN offering, as well as a cloud security and visibility offering as well. And they're trying to bring that together as an integrated fashion. What's difficult and can be cumbersome and certainly has been challenging across this market has been trying to evaluate which strategy to go with. I think a lot of times when we see the pure play SSE, we think, wow, they do really well in that space, but now I've got multiple licensing and support models and I have to go partner with someone else for SD-WAN and I don't know if they're gonna integrate well with each other long-term or if there's any future innovation coming down the pipe. So maybe I wanna go with this uh, complete package, if you will. But then the problem is sometimes you don't get that best in class for everything. You feel as though you're compromising in certain areas, but you're at least getting that one type of license and the one support model. And quite frankly, that's what you're going to face across this environment. So when I think about this, um, I think a key thing to recognize is what is your organization looking to start with today? What do you want to prioritize in this journey? We're not looking to try to solve it all and implement everything at once. So where do you want to focus on and evaluate those vendors at their best? But think of it in a long-term strategy. I think too often we get tunnel vision of, I'm only doing an SD-WAN product and I'll worry about the other stuff later. Or I'm only doing private access and I'll worry about the other strategy later. Open your mind to what that overall journey is going to look like, but still evaluate the capabilities on a per individual basis. Again, trying to come at that as unbiased as possible, but laying it out there of what we see in terms of the you, vendor ecosystem. You did a good job of walking the line there, Dave, because you know it is being recorded. Um, so <laughs> no, Dave, everything you said I, I would agree with. And from my point of view, the benefit that we have at Burwood um, is that we have several great partners that we work with and partner with, and Cisco is one of them. We we do SASE solutions across se uh, several um, of the Gartner Magic Quadrant vendors. And so we, what we look to do as an independent is look to match the customer's vision and roadmap to the best product for them. Um, not necessarily aligned to any one particular because we do them all. We are, you know, obviously high up res resellers for all products uh, in this space. That being said, we all have our preferences. We've all been in through deployment models and in integration models, and we developed our preferences based upon what we what challenges we had and were we were able to overcome them. To specifically answer the question, the Gardner, you know, Magic Gardner says it's Cisco. It's Palo Alto, it's VMware, and there's a there's a two that are kind of uh, backing up on the you know coming up. Fortinet is rising, rose pretty much in the last two years. Their product's pretty good too. We've actually either designed, installed, or work on all four of the all four or five of those. So we have experience with all of those. I um, mean, we try to use and leverage that experience across all those. So when we have customer conversations we're matching what we're hearing from them and where they want to go with the best product. So any one of those four or five products, um, uh, I would say is the leading solutions in the space. Awesome. We'll jump over to uh, Steven's question, looking for an overview of security concerns from various different operating systems. You guys know, shed some light here. Taylor, I'm sorry, I, 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 you dropped out quite a few words on that. I didn't get that question. Yeah, he's looking to uh, see an, or see provided an overview of security concerns from various different operating systems um, and seeing if we can tangle this into SASE would be great. And Stephen, if you have a clarifying question, we can uh, guide us a little better. Please submit that in the Q&A chat as well. Yeah, why don't we just skip to the next one? Maybe he can clarify. I'm not sure what, what the question is. Uh, uh, maybe is it security concerns across things of Windows versus Mac versus Android and iPhone? Exactly. Uh, yeah. okay. All right. Go ahead, Dave. Well, I, I, I wanted to give Sajada an opportunity here to speak because I know I, I put on my okay. vendor hat. So maybe you'll follow after Sajada on this. So. Uh, 
I think the way I would tackle, uh, I think, um, with regards to security um, on the operating system itself is um, having that endpoint security client running, right? So that is the best mechanism to secure um, and uh, do a good patchwork with regards to any vulnerabilities that might be there, right? So the endpoint secure, the client can can uh, address quite a bit of those vulnerabilities itself. And uh, especially with the framework, a framework of um, application, as I mentioned that, you know, um, this is more uh, uh, with regards to the framework we uh, we have uh, you know the the software defined parameter right so it's application basically when they connect they they establish a TLS connection and it's secure so you are only getting access to the to the to the applications that you absolutely need and uh, um, the other part of it is that having those corporate owned assets that users cannot connect from anywhere they want right uh, so those um, uh, machines are already corporate on asset which are patched um, as per best practices. So you're narrowing, narrowing down the footprint of your, you know, those vulnerabilities that, you know, knowing from where the user is connecting and who that user is, right? Knowing those two things, you are taking a step towards that ZTNA, right? The zero trust. Um, that can address uh, all those vulnerabilities that, you know, these um, operating systems can come up with. I'll, I'll bring that into more of that sassy framework, just as you were alluded to with ZTNA. So Scott talked earlier about layering the journey of identity and access and starting with providing access and then bringing identity into the fold and making it more restrictive. And there's another layer to that where it's not just about are you who you say you are, but it's also then your device and your device health. And there's very different vulnerabilities that exist across multiple different operating systems. And we have to be cognizant of that when they access our applications, because again, we're trying to protect that data. So one of the methods that we can leverage from a tool set across ASCII is device posture and the ability to look at trusted devices. You get more capability and visibility on a managed device, of course, right? We can set parameters with our MDM or uh, uh, around saying you have to update your OS every so often or make sure your browser's up to date. But sometimes if it's an unmanaged device or BYOD, we don't get some of those same luxuries. And yet we're expected to be able to provide application access from some of these unmanaged devices. And that can become a real security challenge. And the nice thing with SASE and specifically around the concept of ZTNA is we can build device type profiles and posture assessment that says, you know what, for this application, this per app basis, you're not allowed to come in on an unmanaged device, right? I, it only has to be managed. I need to be able to trust the OS level. I need to be able to trust that your browsers are up to date, that you're running this endpoint software, that you haven't disabled it, right? So that I know that your device is in a healthy state. And then for other applications, ones I might not care about as much and don't risk lateral movement out of, I say, you know, any device can access that. So long as you've got your username password, I don't really care so much about the device you're coming in because there's nothing all that confidential. So now I can become approaching my applications on a per app basis from an access standpoint. And when we contrast that to the traditional approach, it was a, VPN type group policy that would say, well, you just get access to all these resources and applications once you come in and full tunnel over VPN. We're now moving into this per app basis and looking at your device posture, looking at your OS level and ensuring your device health. That's another level of protection that you can bring to your organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, so, I mean, I think that's that really uh, bodes well to the the different levels of implementation that 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 exists across all the areas within the framework, right? There's there's different levels, and you can take it to start in the beginning, and you can make it more restrictive or, or uh, you know lock it down more as you need to. But you know one of the things that we we keep talking about is Z, you know ZTNA, and you know six seven years ago, what we were, I know when I was in that that side of the house, and we were all thinking about how we could redesign our our, our network so we could have segmentation. And it was just about segmentation, right? Because we all built these big flat networks and everybody could talk to everybody if you're on the network. And it's like, oh gosh, that's bad. Let's, let's be more secure and let's, let's do segmentation. 
And now we're in the world of micros and segmentation was a challenge. It could be done readily with the existing infrastructures. Now we're into micro segmentation and really talking about endpoint security at that level, ZTNA. Of no one can talk to me unless I expressly, expressly allow them to talk to me by a group membership or identity, who you are or your machine, or if your machine has passed a posture check, I mean, all these kind of things that all builds into ZTNA, which is, you know, really, really uh, where we're all trying to get to, mostly because ZTNA is what really protects us from those really bad actors and ransomware and things of that nature, right? Um, so you can't just go horizontal across anyone's network and just start probing because at any one given time, there's a vulnerability somewhere. If you have enough time to look for it and you're allowed to go laterally within a network, those are gonna be it. So every layer, this is all about layers, this is, is the point that I'm making to. An endpoint layer is a, Key point, defense in depth has been out there for a while, but to truly understand it is, it's yes, it's endpoint, but it's also at the edge. It's also at your, you know, within the cloud. It's also within each one of your facilities. It, it's all layered approach that we need to take. And that's, that's uh, you know, one of the areas that is important that you look at. Awesome, thanks guys. So we have about 15 minutes left of Q&A, so make sure if you have any unanswered questions, submit them into the chat. Um, pivoting over to Caitlin's question, does a SACI architecture require you to move any currently on-prem services to the cloud? Oh, that's a, that's a good one. That, no, absolutely not. Doesn't require you to do anything. Um, so that's the short side of it. But um, Dave, you want to kind of, well, I mean, I could take that one in a, in a, for several minutes, but I mean, that's a pretty straight question. There's no answer to your questions. There's no requirement for you to necessarily take anything up, right? You can do it as you need to do it as you feel positioned, correctly positioned to do it, right? You never want to move forward with something unless you're really comfortable, not only that you can secure the environment and that you can apply policy in the correct way, but that you can operate it and maintain it and that you can troubleshoot it, right? So those, there's nothing that you must do to be a part of SASE. That's the beauty of this framework is that you can take individual components and as a collective group of them, they're all in there and the, you're increasing your, your posture, security posture, every time you implement one of these frameworks within your environment. And, and Scott, on that point, you know, one question we get a lot is, does this mean I don't need firewalls anymore or do I just throw those away? What do I do with them? And the answer is you keep them. I mean, we still need inbound protections. We still need east-west yeah. visibility across your environment. That has to become part of a larger security story. Uh, but what we do see, at least uh, with the customers I talk with day in, day out, is the biggest shift from on-prem to cloud resource is web inspection for outbound traffic. And that historically has been on a firewall or maybe on a you know web security appliance or a cloud or an on-prem proxy using WCCP or something along those sorts. And now we've moved that into something that's cloud uh, base. And the main reason for it is because of the economies of scale of this cloud environments, as well as the ability to provide a unified policy for my users no matter where they are. You see, if I have a policy or I have my decryption of web traffic occurring on-prem, I have to worry about the hardware resources that are used to instantiate that protection. And Performing decryption is a heck of a hardware beast. It's very resource intensive, usually 50 to 70% performance hit. So a lot of times organizations don't even turn on decryption because it costs too much or as their environment scale, they've got more users and traffic flowing, they start moving some of the traffic flow away from inspection and decryption and now they're losing out on security efficacy. One of the biggest benefits to using a cloud proxy and using that web firewall and application filtering is I can use the economies of scale of those resources in a cloud environment and I don't have to worry about that anymore. I'm simply paying on a per user or a per seat license base rather than throughput basis. I don't have to worry about that. And now I can offload a lot of those controls that would typically be hindering my firewalls and use my firewalls in other ways be able to provide more advanced security inspections for east-west lateral movement or protecting inbound traffic inspection rather than worrying about my outbound connectivity. So that's one of the biggest shifts I've been seeing with customers over the past few years as they move on-prem capabilities to the cloud. But just as Scott said, there's certainly no requirement for it. That's just been the biggest shift 
in the environment so far. Mm -hmm. Good. And then pivoting, we talked a little bit about the, the easy first step being an FD RAN solution to get that SASE journey beginning. Beginning. Uh, I have a question here: is, Do I really need FD WAN? Yeah, no. That's I was getting ready to, to, to clarify that. So what I uh, the words before that were: If you have a remote branch, right, or remote office, part of your first step would be to implement SD WAN, right? Um, and and so it's not a requirement. Uh, SD WAN is not a requirement to say you can't have any SASE without SD WAN. That's not what we're what we're saying. What we're saying is that there are there there are foundational aspects of the framework. And one of those is SD WAN, right? And, and that's from a that that applies to the remote office or remote branch part of that framework. You also have remote user, right? So remote user framework minimum uh, you know requirements would you don't have to have an SD WAN device, right? Because all it needs is a VPN client to the point of we were talking about different use cases. If I'm at home and I have the right the client on my lap on my machine. And I connect, I'm being connected to my cloud delivered firewall in the cloud. Now all my security policy is being governed from that. So I don't necessarily need that. I only have one way to get there and that's through the internet and the broadband. The real benefit of the remote access, um, I'm sorry, from the, uh, for the remote office location is that um, you're now able to provide redundancy with using multiple tertiary you know, types of ac access points. And then within that, I can, by policy, decide which packet or application needs to be inspected and which one doesn't for secure applications and not. So that's really why it's a part of the core foundation of remote office um, is SD-WAN. Any other comments here while we wait for some more questions to be submitted? I, I agree on my end. I don't think there's anything else to say there. Awesome. We'll give it a minute or so here. And if you have any comments in general, people's overall SASE journey is a good filler time to, to share that. Well, let's let's take a, a few minutes here in case we didn't um, cover anything that we wanted to cover. We wanted to add, you know, just kind of do a little ad lib, um, you know, conversation. Um, you know, I think that there's a, a, a it, it's pretty evident from our discussion in the last 45 minutes. We've talked, I don't know, I think I counted six or seven, eight different use cases. Of of sassy and what the what those can be, uh, can be and I, I think if there's one thing that I would ask our audience to take away from this is that um, is that the, your journey is going to be different than everybody else's. Better to start today than not than to start tomorrow, um, and that each part of this can be customized for your particular opportunity um, and your use case that exists within your organization. And then you can once you start on this journey, these are all add-on products. That you can add on to and, and grow into, and uh, you know, from that point forward, and and that's really what I was hoping to, you know, impress. A, you can probably guess, I talked about it a lot today, um, so that was really my main point that I was getting getting across. Um, Dave, you have a, a, a something that you wanted to, you know, just reiterate or or bring up on on that note? Yeah, I mean, it really does come down to it, it's a journey. Not every single component is going to fit for your organization. I think part of it depends on some of the challenges you're currently facing, whether that's connecting users to applications. It could be trying to make sure that you've got visibility across your users connecting to those apps and what their uh, and client performance has been like. It could be that you're trying to move into a more agile model and cloud adoption or cloud capabilities and you want infrastructure to support that. So there's a number of reasons why you might get started on this journey and they all could deliver different outcomes. Um, I think the other thing to recognize is, yes, there's uh, numerous different vendors out there and organizations such as Burwood will help you navigate some of that journey to pick the solution that fits your needs. Part of it could be you already have certain infrastructure in place from a vendor and you're looking for tighter integrations. Part of it could be that you wanna move into a new type of environment, new procurement model, new license model, new support. You name it, right? So that all feeds into uh, the thought process of it. But I think understanding at first what problems you need to solve out the gate is what's going to lead you down the SASE journey. There, there's a number of different use cases and outcomes that can be delivered, and it just matters on, on what problems you're trying to solve. Great. So, John? 
Yep, no, I think I, I can cover with that. So basically, yes, as he has, you know, as we have been saying, it's a journey, right? So you don't have to rip off anything. You don't have to worry about, oh, I need to do this, this, this within this time frame and whatnot. So it is a journey. You plan according to, you know, um, what works for your environment, right? What is what 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 addresses the concerns, and and it 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 is not something that you can go. Okay, I'm going to start today, and probably in two months I would be done. Uh, it's not like that. It is it is as as the security progresses, as you know, um, the company grows, the uh, the implementation, and uh, you know, more and more people. Uh, I think I, I uh, just recently I read about it that almost, you know, uh, 60, 70 percent of uh, and the companies are looking for that they would have a hybrid solution where you know employees would be working from home, and that would become the norm now, right? So. Um, how to address all that, right? So SASE basically is a good framework that addresses how you're going to tackle that. That is a big question, right? Um, your firewalls still will come into play, right? The the zero trust is not going anywhere. So that is where we are heading towards having everything. You know, the big thing about zero trust is that, you know, do you trust no one until you know what who that is, right? Um, yeah, and, you know, trusting that endpoint device from your users are connecting, managing those devices like, you know the firewalls basically uh, play a very good role uh, role in in doing all that application layer control. Plus, the you know um, a good example would be your FM, you know the the, the Cisco um, FMC. You know we were talking about uh, the vulnerabilities in your OS. Cisco FMC kind of addresses all that, right? Looking at okay, which which user is connecting, what kind of OS they're running, and what vulnerabilities are there. It can generate reports and send all that out. So it is basically tying up with what you know what you already have, and uh, and coming into that um, into that model of uh, uh, zero trust in the SASE world, and uh, and using it uh, you know to the best uh, uh, way possible. And I think Burwood, we have we have a very strong team. We have been doing a um, um, lot of security. In, in the SASE world for quite some time. Uh, so I think uh, uh, I hand it back to you, Scott, from you. Awesome. Thank you, Shajab. All righty. Well, panelists, thank you guys so much for providing us some great conversations uh, in terms of helping us guide the SAS, our SASE journeys. Uh, Dave, thank you for joining us. And uh, thank you all for joining us and listening and participating.